Welcome to Rain, the real estate investor growth network with your hostess, Jen Josie. Join like minded real estate investors and accelerate your business towards greatness. You will hear step by step strategies for success, interviews with real estate rock stars, and we will dig deep into past projects where we bear it all, including the good, the bad, and some just plain ugly. So get excited. Here's the bestower of badassery herself, the real Jen Josie. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Jen Josie, creator of Rain, the Real Estate Investor Growth Network. Whoop whoop! On today's episode, we have a guest that will be sharing their badassery. But before we begin, here's today's badassery bestowment, my little badass gift to you. Today's topic is why wholesale. In real estate, wholesaling is a short-term strategy where an investor gets a property under contract, typically below market value, and then assigns that contract to another investor for a profit. On occasion, we have too many leads coming in, so if the numbers work, we will wholesale a property. Other times, the property may be too far away for our contractors, so we will find a flipper in that area and pass the deal on to them. If a seller is reaching out to us because they need to sell a distressed property, by wholesaling it, we can still help that homeowner out of a difficult situation while making a small profit. For people just starting, wholesaling could be a great way to get experience negotiating with sellers. It also helps you to build relationships with other real estate investors. A common misconception is that it doesn't cost a lot to be a wholesaler. You will need to pay for marketing and to find off-market deals unless you are door knocking or driving for dollars and even that costs money. Lastly, it's a great way to make some quick cash without the headache of doing a renovation. I have known some investors that refuse to work with wholesalers because they feel the wholesaler is taking too much of the profit margin. I totally disagree. If you are a wholesaler and can get a property under contract well below market value, you absolutely deserve to sell that contract at whatever rate you choose. If you sell that contract with enough meat on the bones for the investor and can still profit 20K, 30K, or even 50K, well then bravo to you. So next time a deal comes across your desk and it's not a great fit, consider wholesaling. Now on to today's episode of the Real Estate Investor Growth Network podcast. We have with us Carl Spielvogel. Uncle Carl has been investing in real estate since the year 2000. He has built a great team with Alliance Finance Incorporated. They specialize in niche real estate deals. They especially like to focus on the messy deals that few people are willing to do. Deals that involve multiple heirs, hard to locate people, judgments, etc. I am excited to have the GOAT himself on the show. So welcome, Uncle Carl. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yay. And I called you the goat on purpose because I heard this story about you and one of these crazy deals you were finding or trying to you know, earn some money off of involved goats. So can you start off with the story? I love the story. Yeah, this is, uh, this is not one of our typical deals, but you got to get creative sometimes to get these deals to go through. So we had this piece of property. You're going to have to sort of picture this in, in, in your, in your brain, if you can. So there's a piece of property that's surrounded on two sides by the city of Tiga K, but it's actually in the County. So if the County or if the city would annex it into the, to the city, then it'd be worth more money. Okay. So I went down to talk to the city manager. I'm like, Hey, will you annex this property in? You surround it on two sides. It just makes sense for you to annex this in. And he said, I'll never forget. Nope, son. We're not going to annex that in. We're building a baseball field and um, we sort of like to buy your property. I'm like, well, okay. What will you pay for me? And he said, well, I'll pay you 85 to 90,000, somewhere in that range, probably 85,000. I was like, well, let me go back and talk to my partner you know, I think it's a little bit low. So I came back to him and he said, well, I ran our numbers. I think we need to be about 60,000. I'm like, wait a minute. 
it went down. He said, yeah, I'd like to be at 60,000. I'm like, well, let me ask you this. This property is agri- zone agricultural. He goes, correct. You're not going to annex it in. He goes, right. So you have no jurisdiction. He goes, right. So I could open a fucking goat farm on there. And he goes, he was like, well, I guess you could. So I rented goats, had little goat cupcakes made up this banner, Uncle Carl's <laughs> goat farm coming to TVK, Facebook live production. You know, uh, we had one of the neighbors over. Um, we had all sorts of crazy paraphernalia, but you get these, these three little goats running all around. And uh, that day we got a call from the city and they said, well, you know what? We'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars in closing seven days. <laughs> I don't know if they saw the video. I don't know what happened, but it it, it sure works. So that's some of the creative stuff that you do sometimes uh, uh, to get a deal done. You have to open a goat farm. I love that. Did you keep any goats? Because I do like goats. No, we, we just rented them. We rented goats just long enough to do the whole production. And you had t-shirts made and it said Uncle Carl's goat farm. Said, Uncle Carl's goat farm. We buy houses, <laughs> 704 777 so. Oh my goodness. Now I know you through a mutual friend, Terry Thayer. And, uh, I just remember you being on a call. This was a couple of years back and, um, you had your 704, 777, 7777, you know, right behind you. And I was like, man, that's a vanity number right there. And, uh, just quickly tell it. Cause I, I coach students and I tell them, you know, don't even bother with vanity numbers anymore. It doesn't, you know, People are going to be pushing a button on your website regardless, but man, that one really stands out. So tell us about the vanity number. Well, I went to a, uh, a guy's name was John Ulmer. I think he's out of prison now, but anyway, he's a real estate investor. Um, but anyways, he said, you need to have easy to remember numbers for your bandit signs. Now I used to drink heavily. I don't anymore. So one night after 10 beers, I called up 704-77777. I'm like, hey, uh, I want to buy your phone number. The guy's like, dude, you sound drunk. I go, I am, but I do real (laughs) estate and I want to buy your phone number. Like, okay. So he sold me the number for $450. Wow. But I found out why he sold it. It's like, it's like a taxi cab number. So (sighs) taxis all night long, uh, prank calls. People put it down for the employment. It just rings like crazy. It was all sorts of boat. People call up asking for God. I mean, it's just nuts. But, um, and I had an attorney offer me 110,000 for it the other day. Wow. Which I turned off. But it does help. It's a bandit. Cause you hear, you see it on a bandit sign. You're going to remember that. So, yes. you know, and it gives you instant credibility. So that's, that's why we bought it. So absolutely. All right. Well, we're not talking about goats or vanity signs. We are talking about your top 10 deal strategies that we are going to share with the listeners today. And these are some great ones. And I agree a thousand percent. These are messy deals. And I am one of those like, you know, I don't like to get too involved in it, but I just remember you like are going for everything here. So the first one that you like is, but okay, before we get into this, Carl, how rude of me, yeah. give us a little background, how you got involved in real estate. I didn't realize you've only been doing this since 2000. And I say that only, yeah. I mean, that was what, 23 years ago, it feels like, you know, 10 years ago, but, um, I, how'd you get involved I, I in real estate? Well, a friend of mine said there's a guy named Ron the Grand, and he's teaching this really cool real estate stuff. So I went to his course. I'm like, I got hooked. I'm like, this is great stuff. And the time I had some Subway sandwich shops, which I hated. Oh, my God. It was miserable. So I ended up selling my Subways and went into real estate you know, after listening to Ron the Grand. So that's sort of how I got started into it. And then we started learning that there's these – we'd run into these messy deals with heirs, with judgments – with you know different problems and we started just working through with the attorneys how to solve them and we over time we became experts you know at at these type deals and these are deals that everyone would walk away like like someone said oh you can't close because there's judgments so I'm like why well you got to deal with the judgment so like well can we what can we do and finally we learned that I'll just jump right in here to judgments you can buy the judgment you can discount the judgment you can pay to get it released or you can wait till it expires. Okay. Most judgments are good for 10 years. Give me an example of a judgment. A judgment might be Ford Motor Credit. It might be the IRS. It might be HD Supply. It might be a credit card. You know, those are all examples of judgments. And um, let me and, just and jump they, into a. 
Okay, but they go against a property and then, so that would hold up the, the sale of the property. Yes. Okay. If you got judgments, people won't typically buy them. Okay. Because you got judgments, they have to be cleared up. Like you go to any normal attorney, they're going to say those have to be cleared up. But we'll we'll take them on. And let me just just give you a, a perfect example of one. Um, first of all, our best deals are property tax delinquents. I shouldn't probably tell you that because now I'm going to have competition. That's our best deals. <laughs> but you have to dive in deep. So this one was owned by a defunct corporation. And there's rules about that that we can. We also learn all these cool grandfathered zoning clauses and uh, legal loopholes. So real quick, in North Carolina, if there's a defunct corporation, the old owners can still sign and you can still sell the property. Okay. But so anyways, they had a 25,000 in taxes, a $74,000 judgment HD supply. And I think it was a 64, $66,000 to um, Ford motor credit. Wow. Okay. So we gave them $15,000. We went back and forth. They said, look, we've got a lot of problems. Here's 15,000. We'll take it, take over the problems. Now, this is real important. Taxes are always in first place. Then HD supply got clocked first. That judgment came in first. Ford Motor Credit's in third position. It's important to know the positions. So all we did is we called, we just called HD supply up, skip traced them, called them up. I said, hey, I'm Carl Spill with Alliance Finance. We want to buy this judgment. And they're like, well, how much will you pay? And we're like, we'll pay you 15. And they're like, well, how about 16? So we bought a seventy-four thousand wow. dollar judgment for sixteen thousand. Now, so th- what's the property worth? This property, I think we sold it for two hundred and fifty something thousand. So you get it from the owners. You take ownership at fifteen thousand and say you're going to take over everything. So now oh. we're we're wiping out a large part of debt for only fifteen thousand. All right, keep going. Yep. yep. So we so we got the seventy-four down to sixteen. Then we okay, called it Ford Motor Credit. And we got that down. It was either sixty-four or sixty-six thousand, and we negotiated down to twenty-two thousand. Okay, and then so after we negotiated down, now here's the important thing: we bought the property with title insurance, subject to the taxes of these two judgments. So we know everything else is clean on the property. Does that make sense? So okay. we just know we have three problems. So by buying the one judgment and discounting the other judgment, now we sold it. We just listed on the MLS. And sold it. And we made one hundred and forty three thousand on that one deal. Okay, so I'm doing my numbers here. I'm not a mathematician, but you said okay. fifteen thousand, then a sixteen thousand, and then twenty two thousand is what you had to pay off. So that's fifty three thousand plus the original fifteen. So that is you are all my... in. You're all in for sixty eight thousand. Yeah. And you sold it for how much? Uh, I think it was two fifty three. Wow. And did you do anything to the property? Um, we had a site plan brought up. We spent $1,800 to see where they could build. That's all we did. We had a site plan drawn up and then we listed it. I did. And, and actually I sort of lied here. Instead of me negotiating that, that, that to, to buy the, the buy the judgment for 15,000, I was so chicken. I had my attorney call up. So my attorney <laughs> called up. I was like, can you call him afraid? So he called up <laughs> and he was the one that negotiated that. Wow. So, All so right. I was, but, but the thing was, and I, I paid him a $5,800 bonus for, for doing that. But the point that I want people to realize, now here's the cool thing. Judgments, again, are typically good for 10 years. They can be renewed. Okay. Now they only renew against the person. So on this thing, this is big. So what we could have done on this deal, these judgments were seven and a half years old. I could have waited two and a half more years and the judgments would have expired. Wow. And we've done, a, I'll tell you about a couple of deals like that. That so, is mind blowing. And then think, here's, here's another thing about judgments. Typically people like Ford Motor Credit, AC to Supply, they are dumbasses. <laughs> they don't even realize the people have property. They try and collect, but they could take them 30 seconds and say, oh, they own this property. I'm secure. They don't even do that. Wow. So I know that they're not, because technically they can foreclose on the property, Okay. but Ford Motor Credit doesn't, AC Supply don't, they just try to collect on their judgment. And the sellers are getting 15K in their pocket to start yep. fresh somewhere else. And they were going to walk away from it. We create the equity by working with the judgments. That is fantastic. And is this nationwide? Like how do judgments, do they differ from state to state? 
I think they can a little bit. Okay. It's all basically the same. Okay. Got there's it. a whole, there's a whole ton of money that we do a lot of deals with these judgments again, where we buy them, we let them expire, different things like that. That is awesome. I got to check that out. Do you just stay over there in Charlotte so I can like hoard the Raleigh area? You're going to need to call me to, you can't do this by yourself. You need special, <laughs> special help. Please. All right. So another one. So that's number one. We have judgments. Let's go with air deals and that's H E I R and people don't ever call it hair. It's air deals. So explain what those are. Uh, well, first of all, we love dead people that own property. <laughs> they are the best. We just love it. But this is like, so vacant houses, tax delinquents, foreclosures. Sometimes the person will be deceased. And, and, and so a lot of times they're supposed to do a, uh, open an estate and have a will. But I would say 80% of the time when you're doing the tax links, foreclosures, this kind of stuff, they don't have wills. Right. So it just follows the intestate laws. Okay. So we'll find a property that's vacant or it's a tax delinquent. And we use this skip trace coming called been verified. We just put them in there and they'll say if they're dead or alive and it gives you all sorts of information. So that's, the, so basically, you know, we're, we're looking to see if the person's deceased or not. And if they're dead, we're like, yay, dead people. Um, but but I know that sounds crazy, but we're, we get excited about dead people. And then what we do is we look for the obituary, okay? And then we'll just call the relatives. And I'll just give you an example of one deal that we did. And, and so, so we've got professionals that build trees out for us. Um, my biggest deal right now is 50 heirs. I wouldn't do that again. That's too much. Wow. Yeah, that wasn't worth the time. Ugh. A lot of this can be simple. And I'll tell you, there's a property, I think it's 2104 Rushland. It was a foreclosure. We put the lady uh, into been verified, the owner. She was deceased. We went and found her obituary, newspapers.com. This is how simple it can be. And it said her one daughter was Tanya. So we skip traced Tanya and we called her and then we called her. Then we called her and we called her. And then we called her and we called her and we called her and then we texted her and then she finally responded. So, so part of this too is being in the air. You got to be really uh, persistent yes. and you can't give up. That's a, you know, one of the things, but anyways, we finally just said, Hey, look, I know your mom passed away. You own this property. I'm just curious. And she's like, I don't want anything to do with it. My mom died, you know? And I'm like, look, you come meet us. You just sign one piece of paper. You're quitting your claim. And, you know, we'll give you seven or 50 bucks versus getting nothing. So she quick claimed the property to us for 750 bucks. This oh is an heir. And what was the property valued at? Well, now it's worth 280,000. Wow. And we owe 20,000 on the mortgage. Oh my goodness. Now this was about three years ago. Okay. So the, the value was less. So we have 7,500 invested. We took it subject to the mortgage, caught the mortgage up maybe 3000 or so for renovations. This will be paid off in 2027. So we've got six, six years and four more months. It'll be free and clear. Now, most of the other people, what they were doing is they were trying to call um, the, the owner, but she was dead. She didn't answer the phone. For them, okay. So if they just would have taken one or two steps to find the one, so that's a, that's an example of a simple one, a simple air deal. Wow. And that was a foreclosure one. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll make, let's say and keep it six more years. We sell it for 300. Um, plus this cash flow, it'll be over $300,000. What's it cash flowing a month? Um, I should, my partner takes care of the rent. I'm guessing it's, tw we rent for 12 to 1300. Nice. I think the payment's like five with taxes, insurance and everything. Wow. But see, what's great too, it's a subject too. So we just had to reinstate it and we're paying all principal now versus because you, you know, you, amortization works, you pay interest more in the beginning and principal in the end. So that was a huge air deal um, uh, that we did. All right. So you mentioned subject to, so let's dive into that one next. Uh, you, <clears throat> you have written down here subject to and owner financing. So explain what that type of strategy is. 
We don't do a lot of this. It's basically taking over property subject to typically a foreclosure where the people are going to lose it. You give them some money and then it's just, you're, you're taking, you're basically taking over the mortgage, paying them out, whatever the reinstatement is. And you own the property, but the mortgage stays in somebody else's name. Right. Okay. And what's so great about this is a, you're not having to borrow. And typically these are paid down or been paid on for years. And again, if you ever look at amortization schedule, you're paying mostly interest in the beginning. So they're paying all this interest. So if you take something that's been, been paid on for 10 years, they may have paid three quarters of the interest for you. So that's, you know, again, you're not qualifying from a bank. You are just simply taking the mortgage over where they paid a fair amount of the interest. And typically, you know, they're at, at a decent interest rate. So they're, the advantage is huge on doing subject twos. So how do you run this as far as paperwork? Because if you go up to someone and say, hey, I'm going to start paying your mortgage for you, but it's going to stay in your name, but give me the, you know, the deed to your house. How, how do you work all that legally? Well, well we have good attorneys. That yes. do that, but the main thing is when we talk to them is we say, hey, you know, like it's foreclosure. Hey, look, I know it's going to foreclosure. We can help save your credit. And, you know, and, and the, the whole key is to ask them, what their situation, what they want to find out, solve their problem. You know, the first thing is never be there to buy anybody's house. Hey, you know, I know you're going to foreclosure. I know it's getting, you know, uh, it's behind, you know, you know, my company here, I'm here to you know, talk some options for you. And we, we actually, we try to help the people out. We, we talk to them about, I'm going to go off a little, I'll get back. We, we, we actually spend time like, can you borrow from a 401k? Do you have any family members? Do you have any credit cards? You know, we go through all the stuff to try to help them first. Okay. But the best subject twos are the ones where the people are in foreclosure. Okay. Okay. Cause they don't really care. And we just basically simply say, look, we're going to take over your mortgage or like, or like, we'll say, well, how about we give you X dollars, 5,000, and then we're going to take over your mortgage and you can just walk away from this. And that, that's how I usually say it. Now the paperwork, I'm not real good with it. I do some chicken scratch, get them to <laughs> sign and I give it to my attorney and he, he makes it right. Because I mean, I'm I'm just wanted you to uh, to eva- to elaborate on it because a lot of people first hear that and they're like, how is that even legal? But yes, attorneys are included; they're involved. It's written up, you know, and the bank is happy because you're making payments. You've got them current on the loan, and so it's it's a win win for everyone. So part of this one here, you also talk about owner financing. So do you want to touch on owner financing real quick? Yeah, I've only done a handful of these deals. I have friends that do this, but here's where you make the huge money, okay? I've got friend Avi and Melissa Hall here in this, and this is what they do. They'll take over foreclosure, and let's say it's been paid on seven or eight or 10 years. They'll take it subject to, then they'll find what's called a penalty box buyer, somebody with some credit issues, or they may not be able to qualify for some reason, and then they'll sell it to them probably at full market value or a little bit more, get a down payment, and then they'll finance it at, say, 9% interest, okay? So what, what you're doing is you're arbitrating the difference between you're charging nine okay. and you're probably at four and a half, okay? Plus the fact that you pay most of the print, and then they'll put it on a 30-year AM. So basically, I mean, the average deal like this is like 150000 plus on the average deal because you're taking over payments where the interest has been paid, right, or most of it, and and – and then it's been paid down, and then you're starting back at 30 years, you're being the bank, and you're financing to somebody else. And those those deals are huge. Wow. Oh my goodness. And we are only three in on this list of 10 here. So I am loving this. All right, so n- another one on here is creative, creative subdividing. Oh, I love this. This is one of the things that you, like, we look for, Double lots, triple lots, a lot of stuff on the GIS. A lot of people think, oh, I just got a bigger piece of land. And And GIS listeners, by the way, is the Geographical Information System. And every county has one. You can search for, just put in your county and put in GIS, and it will pull up information about the um, parcels, et cetera, everything within your, your community. I'm sorry, keep going. Yeah, so we use our GIS to look for double lots, triple lots, and we we use a lot of legal uh, loophole, uh, loopholes in the zoning code. We've learned a lot of stuff. Like there's some lots that don't look like they're subdividable, but we can, 
we got a magic Uncle Carl trick we did. So they look <laughs> like they're one thing. I'm not going to exactly say it. So so we get we get a lot. The people think, oh, this one lot, and we can make it into two. So that's the creative subdividing. And here's another example too. This you have to visualize. It. Um, we have this one lot R4. You need 60 foot of frontage. Okay, so you need 60 feet. This lot's 100 feet. So how much feet are you short? 20 feet. 40. 20. Wait, say it again. You need 60 and you have 100. Right. So you need another 20 feet. 60 plus 60 oh, is 120. Oh, to make two. Gotcha. Yeah, to make two. We're, we're always trying to get creative okay. here. So we bought this one lot. And then long story, we're going to try to buy the, the other lot next to it was 100 foot. So we would have bought that. We could combine both of those and get in three lots, right? Right. So we tried. And again, the guy on the left was a New Yorker. And we know how they are. So that didn't want to know where. Um, and then and other people on the right, we couldn't get them to do anything, but we figured out there were zoning laws. If we bought 20 feet by 30 feet, so picture this 20 feet of frontage by 30 feet back. So that's what it was 20 by 30, 600 square feet Okay. from the neighbor. And we combined with our lot, then we could resubdivide it. And I've got, I got slides I can show you. So we, we, we bought 20 feet from a neighbor, 20 feet by 30 feet. Combine it to our lot. Now we have two lots. So it has to go the, the, so we're talking about road frontage here. It has road to be in, frontage. And you are, but it has to go 20 feet back as well. 30 feet back. 30 feet, feet back. Got it. So, yep. Wow. So, so it's like we, we, we spent, we actually paid them 20,000. So did 000. the New Yorker give you 600 square feet? No, we told them to go to hell as a New Yorker. <laughs> So we had to buy from other people. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sure there's some nice New Yorkers out there. Some just, yes, there are. Um, so <laughs> I, I hope people realize I'm kidding, but anyways, yes. but, but, but that's the kind of stuff we look for. So we spent $20,000 and we increased our value $40,000. Wow. But that's, but you know, that's just, we, we have another one. You're going to have to, I wish I could show you. Well, just pictures in your mind. We got this one lot we bought for 62,000. Then there's another lot in the corner. We bought that for 168. So we bought one lot. We bought the other lot. We went down to zoning and we knew that they said we could face the other road and subdivide it into four. So we so we have one lot plus one. We added them together and then we faced the other road and we end up with four lots. Does the, that make sense? So another, you're increasing the, the road frontage. The road frontage on the other side. Gotcha. I got, yeah, I should have, I but anyway, so, so that's the stuff we look for. We made 166,000 on that one deal. And so are you buying just land or are you buying property that has houses on it? We do both. Okay. We buy, we, we do, we, 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 we 70% of our business is land. Wow. I love it because people are not attached to the land right? and it's easier to sell. And we've learned so many creative ways. Like we're always looking at what if we buy this and do this and put them together? How can we subdivide them and get extra lots? Um, another thing that's cool that we do, we also do, so that's, that's sort of the creative subdividing. Well, I got, I got some, like one time we bought this one lot and we, and, and we found out that we could subdivide it into three. So we ended up cutting it up. So there's all sorts of great things like this, that, that, that you, that if you learn that and the zonings, um, that you can make a lot of money, you know, subdividing stuff and combining with other stuff and re subdividing it. It's like a puzzle. So we have a property um, just north of us that the house was built in the center of two parcels. So we have a renter in there right now, the gentleman who passed, we yeah. dead people. Yay. Um, yep. So we got this property and he was disabled. So it had all the bars and everything. And this renter is also disabled. So she needed those things. It was a perfect fit for her, but the house is not in the best of shape. So as soon as she moves out, we're going to tear it down and build two. But what I'm thinking is because there is a very large road frontage there. I wonder if we can even divide it into three. Yes. Hmm. So take a look at it. And, I and love we that. really great surveyors and that help us figure out how to do this stuff and the credit stuff. This is fantastic. Um, I'll tell you another, this, this is well, another really weird piece was a piece we had that was zone multifamily 22. And my surveyor looked at it and said, look, we can only get one duplex and we couldn't buy any land. The other has a habitat house. Other people couldn't sell any other land. They're like, there's no way to buy any other land. I'm like, oh man, there's gotta be something here. He goes, you, you're short, you can't put another duplex. I'm like, well, what about a house? He's like, 
oh, that's a good idea. So we were able to subdivide in an L shape and carve out just enough so that we could get a house on there. So, so we went from only being able to put a duplex. Now we can, we can carve out and we couldn't do two duplexes, but we could carve out just enough to do a house. So now we just created extra $50,000 in value wow. by looking at it differently. So changing it from two doors to three doors, two doors to three doors. Wow. Yeah. All right. Just, well, this is fantastic. I could talk to you for hours on this. So let's keep going through this list here. Uh, you have using the GIS system. I think we pretty much already kind of touched base on that. Yeah. Anything else you want to add about using the GIS system? We look for houses with extra land that we can subdivide off. Um, we got one right now. This is actually a foreclosure in Bessemer City. It's a house that we can subdivide three lots off. So we're going to create an extra ninety thousand dollars in value by subdividing the lots off, fixing the house up, selling it, and we're only going to make about probably thirty thousand to forty thousand on the the fix of the house, but we'll make the money in the land. So I call this the value add checklist. I'm always looking at everything, how I can combine, re-subdivide. Um, that's probably the last thing on the credit. Oh, another thing that we do too, we do these things called variances. What we do is we find these lots that are too small to build on, okay? And then we hire a variance attorney and he takes it through the, the, the board of adjustments and we just have to show some kind of hardship. Now these have to be lots of record from back before 1990 or something. I don't know the exact amount. So we're, this is another value add. And basically they're, they're allowing us to bring the setbacks out more so we can still build on it. So we're taking some unbuildable and making it buildable. Oh, wow. We bought this one lot for 23,000. We did the variance and sold it for 160. So who are, who's buying these lots? Who are you selling these to? Builders. Okay. Builders. And, and these are mostly in your area or? Yep. Wow. yep. These are all the, every, you know, we've done at least 12 to 15 variances. My goodness. We all were right. averaging a hundred thousand per variance. We're not anymore, but we were averaging a hundred thousand. We bought that one lot. This lady threw in for $500. We did the variance and sold for 95,000. You know, we bought another one for 12,000, did the variance and sold it for 140. <laughs> But so this is, this is it's a little niche that we've learned that we run with, you know, like if anyone tells us like, don't do this or what we're like, well, why, how can we make this work? And we just go figure it, figure it out. My goodness. I, I did not think this list could keep going, but we have on here title issues. So explain to me how you work with title issues. Uh, I guess title issues are usually, uh, that's a good question. It's, it's like, Maybe the property, like somebody was married and then the, just the husband signed and you, know, you might have, and, 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 you know, or there's multiple heirs, you got to go back and get signatures to clear up or um, trying to think of you know, most, most of our title issues are with heirs and, and buying out the heirs shares and clearing those up. But it could be anything from like there's judgments on the property to um, they, they missed a signature from a husband one point or was deeded from the wrong person or something like that. We so just, it's like we a just, clouded title is what they call it. A clouded title. Okay. Yeah. And we like those because we usually can clear those up. Yeah. A lot of people hear that and they, they run. So interesting. And who does this investigation for you? Like who? We, we just, we just, we get the title report back, okay. find out what the problems are and we just take them one by one, Ugh. you know, like, okay, you've got a judgment or sometimes it'll be like, they have an old mortgage like that was never canceled. Like, Hey, you can't sell it. There's an old mortgage on here from first union bank. Like, okay, we'll take it on. And we have to go through the process and get it canceled. Wow. You know, I mean, just, just whatever comes up, we find a way to fix. All right. So for time here, I want to get through the, this one that seems very interesting to me, but utilizing grandfather zoning codes and legal loopholes. I'm sure that one is loaded. So what is going on with that strategy? Legal loopholes in North Carolina, if someone's been passed away two years, you don't have to open probate. Sometimes, you know, and that makes it a lot easier because probate takes time. You have to advertise for creditors. Sometimes stuff come out in the woodwork. So this is a great thing to know. Now, 
talk to your attorney. I'm not an attorney. All those disclaimers. If you die, because something I do, it's not my fault. Okay. So Carl, so- let me ask you a quick question on this, because I actually ran into a situation where a gentleman was living in his mother's townhome and she had passed two years prior and he was living there the whole time, but did not pay anything. Nice gentleman, just he didn't pay the HOA, he didn't pay for the mortgage, etc. But it had hit that two year mark. And it was something where I hit a wall, I was trying to do the um, subject to type financing for it. And we just couldn't make it work. I had an attorney, actually, my the attorney is out of um, Charlotte. And I just can't remember her name off the top of my head, um, who does a lot of subject to deals. Attorney in your area? Do you know who I'm talking about? No. Uh, Stephanie Cooper. Cooper Law. I think, I think, yeah, I've heard of them, yeah. Okay. She, she was great, but there there was just too much was owed. It was upside down. It was it like we couldn't get it to work. But do you have any suggestions on maybe, because you're so creative with this, a step further that I could have done and helped this gentleman? Was he the only heir to the property? He was the only heir to the property. Yeah. Okay. Somebody, um, well, he could have. He could have just quick claimed it to you guys and you could have taken it subject to if there's enough equity. It was like two years and a month. So it was no longer, it ran out of that probate. Uh, well, you, did, did, you don't need to open, did, was probate open? No. No, you don't need to open probate. Okay, good. You don't need to open probate. You just, boom. Or but, you can even get the deed signed before then and whatever, but you just can't get title insurance to about two years. And then the HOA was the one who started the foreclosure process before the mortgage company and- it was a massive number. So I was told, oh, you just negotiate it down and we couldn't even work with them. To ne- and I too was scared and said, uh, Stephanie, my Mrs. Attorney, can you please do the phone call for me? So she did as well because I said, I'm scared. And uh, we, we couldn't get them to negotiate a number down. So it just nope. number wise, it didn't work for us. Yeah. yeah. So that's one example. Of the, if the numbers don't work, okay. you know, simply you, you could, you know, uh, ran We'll run title on the air, make sure the only air, you have to get these things called air affidavit. Someone has to sign a uh, affidavit saying that they are the only air, da, 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 da. But, but you, he could have just simply quit claim the deed or hmm. general, whatever the deed to you and you would own the property. Interesting. You don't, you know, yeah. Right. And, oh, speak, speaking of heirs, let me go into if, uh, um, I'm going to go a little bit to um, excess proceeds and a little bit about buying partial interests. Okay. okay? So a lot of times there'll be some heirs, okay? And maybe be like, let's say there's just a brother and sister. Let's keep it simple. Well, let's say you buy the brother's share out, okay? We had one at uh, 40, something 09 Bank Street. We bought the brother's share out, okay? So we we bought half of it, right? Now the other half was owned by this, his sister was crazy. She's holed up in a house without electricity and water. And, and the brother told us that she liked Kentucky Fried Chicken, fruit baskets, this is so we left her for Kentucky Fried Chicken, fruit baskets. They would disappear, <laughs> but we couldn't get her to come out. So anyway, so we own half a house. So what do you do in those situations? You own half a house. What are you going to do? I have no idea. Just saw it in half. <laughs> no, no. What you do is, that was cheesy. You have two different options here. It was tax delinquent, right? We could have let it go to the tax sale. And since we own half of it, we would get half of the excess proceeds. So let's say the tax sells 10,000 and it sells for 80,000. We, we can legally collect $40,000. Now there's a lot more stuff. You have to check judgments or it's more complicated than that. That's the simple version. Okay. Or you can do what's called a partition sale. So now we own half of it. We just, we, the court will, it will go to sale to court. The highest bidder will get, will get the property. And you own half of it, you get excess proceeds for that. That's a partition sale. So so when we're buying out, like we build a family tree, we want to try to get everybody, but we don't care. If we get half of it, we can do a partition sale or let it go through and collect the excess proceeds. Okay. Um, So we have multiple exit strategies. And and you know what gets even cooler sometimes? We run judgments. And sometimes we'll buy the judgments against the heirs or the judgments against the property at a discount or we'll, we'll buy it with all that stuff and we'll wait till they expire. And I mean, going back to the family situation here, you have yeah. a brother and sister and you're helping the brother out. You know, he's, right. he's getting out and the crazy sister is the one who is the problem and yeah. just, you know, not, not dealing with it. So, you know, in that situation, you're, you're helping that family really. Yeah, because they were going to get nothing in, right. with the way, this, the way it was headed. So he got something and then we did the, um, um, the partition sale. 
Now, real quick, with the partition sale, you win either way. Okay. If it goes for low at the courthouse, you buy it because you already own half of it. <laughs> all right. If it goes for high, you let it go and you collect the excess proceeds on your portion. <laughs> you win either way on a partition sale. What if so there's the like four siblings and you only four own a quarter of it? That's fine. Okay. You can still do a partition sale. Wow. But but the way we do it is we give them like to give them two options. One is we'll give you X dollars to buy your share out. Or um, we'll give you, you like $100 to give us the deed and we'll pay you more when we're able to monetize the property. Oh, my goodness. My brain is on overflow right now. I think we have hit most in this list here. Um, did oh. we do the grandfather zoning codes? That's, that's, that's some of the stuff I'm going to keep secret. But there's okay. some really good cool stuff. Out, out there that that just know that we're able to double we're able to split lots sometimes you can't don't think you can split by using some of these older grandfather zoning club and i can't tell i can't show people that because that's too valuable well um, but let me tell you one other deal about okay. about a, a, a judgment okay so we ha- and he, this is where creative subdividing comes in um there's this property is three pieces but two of the pieces could be subdivided that there's two up front. So they could be subdivided into three. So we can create an extra $70,000 in value on this deal. So again, this is, we target, we just look for stuff. I call it the value ads. Okay. And then we just skip and call the people. So we did have to negotiate this deal for for, for a year. It'd be too much to go into, but when we pulled title, the guy had a $700,000 judgment. Oof. We're like, dude, we have a little bit of a problem here. You got a seven hundred thousand dollar judgment, um, and we went through it. And I said, you know what? We went back and forth. And I said, I tell you what, I'll give you sixty nine thousand for these three three pieces of land, and I'll take over this dealing with this judgment. He's like, okay. So I was a little bit nervous, but this judgment this is in October. The judgment expired in uh, February. Only four more months. And it was a defunct bank that's assets have been sold off. So I knew I had nothing to worry about. So what we did is we bought it, paid cash. Now, some people be scared. We got title insurance subject to that one judgment. And then four months after that, the judgment came off and we were able to get title insurance because they expired. Why was it so high? Why was the 700,000? Um, it was for some other property or something he'd done somewhere else. And defaulted, and then then all the interest and fees it added up for years and years and years. And even though even though there was never a lien against, like there's never a mortgage against this property, but because it's a judgment against him right. and his other stuff, it attached to that property. So it's something he had to deal with because it, it attaches to the person, not to the property. Well, the person when they own the property, right? So so this judgment was there. So now could they could have they renewed it? They could have, but it's already in my. A different company's name, right. so it only renewed against him. Okay, so I, I wasn't worried about it. And it was a defunct bank that their their uh, assets had been sold off. I knew nothing was coming back. But the reason we really wanted this property is we so we we took a little bit of a risk there. I know some people be like, you shelled out seventy sixty nine thousand dollars with a seven hundred thousand dollar judgment. Yep, yep. <laughs> I wasn't worried about it. I mean, worst case, what I lose sixty nine thousand dollars. I mean, it's right. that's but anyways. But so what we did is we subdivided the two pieces in front into three pieces. We sold each piece for seventy thousand. Oh my goodness! And then we kept a little piece that was twenty five feet, and we're negotiating with the neighbor next door because they have an extra twenty five feet that they can sell us from their land and it won't affect it. So we can probably put those two together. Okay. I'm not saying it's going to work, but we're trying to do that. Okay. And then there's a piece in the middle that was sort of landlocked and, you know, we couldn't do a lot with. So it was zone industrial. So we traded it to the other owner next door. Just to make, I traded to him for a piece that he has that was um, uh, buildable. So like he's get, the, the, the other owner is getting an industrial piece. Okay. okay? And, 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 it's, and it sort of goes like, into his land. I wish I could show you, but anyway, so, so he wanted that piece and he had another piece that was out on the main road and it was much smaller. So I'm like, let's just trade. He's like, Oh man, I love it. Let's do it. So we took a piece we couldn't do much with trade to him for a piece that I think we can sell for about 60, 65,000. 
So that's that's a combination of creative subdividing, judgment, trading property. You you, you got to look at all these different value adds to get the deal done. So that'll probably be a two hundred thousand plus deal. Well, I appreciate you sharing all of these messy deals that few people are willing to do. And this is so great for the listeners because they may have heard this, stuck it back in their brain. And then at some point they go, oh, Uncle Carl was talking about this. So how can the listeners find you if they have any questions? Well, um, if you forget my number, you can always call and leave a message on 704-777-7777. I, or, I, sh- I should have started there, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, or I'll, I'll give you my personal phone number, but text me. It's uh, 704-995-5385, 704-995-5385. And you are willing to JV, JV with people, and you know if they bring you these messy deals, you can uh, split the profits on here? Yeah, we will never give you 50% because we have so much overhead and right. so much work into it, but we'll, we'll have a joint venture split on it. Probably shouldn't have said that, but unless it's a $2 million deal, but yeah, we, we joint venture with people. We pay them referral fees, consultants, all, all sorts of stuff, but please pre-vet your deals. I, I look at a lot of stuff that's garbage and I'm like, ah, so that's all I ask. Well, Carl, thank you so much. And you heard me at the at the start of this episode, and I gave a badassery bestowment. Do you have a little bit of advice that you can share with the listeners? One of the things is be curious. Okay. And when people say you can't do it, say why. So people say, <laughs> oh, you, like people say, oh, you can't do this because there's heirs. Why? Well, they all have to sign. Why? Can I buy part of it? Well, I guess you could. You can't do this because of judgments. Well, why? Well, they have to be paid off. Why? You know, it's just like, and and then, and so another thing is, yeah, ask why to find out the reason. And another thing is reach out to experts. The reason I learned about the variance thing was I reached out to a a specialist. I've got a great surveyor can help me come up creative stuff. I got a lot of these different things. So, so reaching out to experts is a really good thing uh, that, that, you know, that's why I, I am very, very smart. Because I'm experts that tell me what to do, <laughs> not because I'm smart. Does that make sense? Well, I think you are so smart, and I appreciate you sharing your wisdom here on the show. And the second half of the podcast is what makes Carl a badass, which clearly you are. And I use the acronym BADASS, and the first letter is B for book. What's a book that's made a huge difference in your life? There's tons of them. I am. Um, I think who not how is a great book. Oh yes. That's a good book. It's like, who, who can help me with this? Right. You know, it, it's reaching out to the the zoning person, reaching out to the expert. So I think I like who not how is really good. Um, I like decisive by Chip Hardy and uh, I think it's Dan Hardy. I think that's who I, I'm and, and um, trying to think. I just, I, I have like 324 books in my um, audible and I listen to them all night long. Um, God, I could get, but anyways, those, those are some of the ones that I would recommend there there's, but there's hundreds of great books. I just can't think of them right now. Yes. And, and agreed. And who not how is by far one of my all time favorites. I was just, Oh, I didn't want that book to end. It was so good. All right. The first a in badass is for advice. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Hmm. That's, I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of what, uh, I know you sent me questions, but I don't know what's the best advice. Maybe listen, talk less and listen and be curious and learn, but I, I don't know. I just, I, I, sorry. Talk less and listen. I love that. I think yeah. that is great. All right. The D in badass is drive. What drives you to be successful? I need a wife. So I, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, what are you I'm looking be, for? Uh, I, 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 someone who loves to talk real estate, um, <laughs> that doesn't mind someone very disorganized and all over the place and that doesn't want to have sex very often. So those are my criteria, <laughs> uh, for my wife. No, I just, what, what, what was the question again? I have ADD. What drives you to be successful? Uh, part of it is I like sort of the notoriety and stuff. And I just know that having money will makes life easier. At least uh, that's my 
They thought, you know, so true. You know, you know what though? Like uh, we were talking just before we go on about like some of my overhead and, and you know, I, I do, we do have issues too here. It's not, but, but we're always, we're always cash poor because our money goes into another deal that's messy. So that's one of the the bad things about what we do is mm-hmm. it's, it's, it can be um, risky. It, it's not as risky as like you're always damn broke because your money's going to another messy deal and no one wants to loan money on it. So that's the only bad thing about what we do. Got it. All right. The second A in badass is for aspiration. I'm a big goal setter. So what's a goal you are currently working on besides finding a wife? Oh, God. <laughs> to actually have some money in my bank account and not have it go out. So that is one of my goals to, 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 to save some money, to have some capital backing uh, versus that. Um maybe to get rid of some of some of the really hairy deals and do some easier stuff. I, mm. I don't know. I don't, I, I should have a goal, but I don't really have one. Easy is so fun. Come to the mm. easy side. <laughs> All right. The first S in badass is for systems. What systems do you have in place to help you achieve success? Uh, we have Podio. We have, I have a lot of, we have a lot of really good virtual assistants but what kind of systems? Well, what's on that board behind you over there? Well, this is chicken scratch. Okay. <laughs> this, this is just all sorts of stuff. Have you, remember, have you ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm sort of like that. And just, it's on your door too. I see writing on what? your door. Oh yeah. There's writing on the door. Oh, you can't see if there's writing on all the walls everywhere. <laughs> so that, that sort of helps, but, um, I think, I think the podio and the follow-up systems, uh, that's, 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 you know, and we have checklists, checklists and evaluating, like, um, evaluating the tax delinquents step by step, nice. you know, look at the value ads, look at the deed, what can, you know, so I'd, I'd say checklists and, um, the podio system are the sort of what we have for systems. Awesome. All right. To wrap this up, the final S and badass is for success. What does success mean to Carl Spielvogel? Hmm. I don't know. What does it mean? What does it mean to me? I don't know. <laughs> you ever had to answer that? I, I don't know. I mean, for me, successful is to, you know, be able to make money. I, I love doing the, I love for me, it's like creating the deals. It's like making, making, making Shinola out of shit or whatever it is. You know, it's like uh, putting, I, I don't know what I, I don't really know. I think for you, it is taking a no and turning it into a yes. Cause I yeah. feel like you are so successful at that. We're, we're great at figuring out how to get through deals and monetize stuff that a lot of people can't. Well, I appreciate you so much for being on the show and the listeners can find you by calling 707, no, 704, excuse me, 704-777-7777. And ladies, check out his photo on the cover of this uh, podcast and check him out, which by the way, I need your headshot so I could finish this episode here. But um, thank you, Carl, so much for being on the show. It's it's been such a pleasure. Man, you have some great nuggets on here. So thank you very much. Sure. And that is all. Thank you for listening and we will catch you Mm -hmm. on the next episode. Now go out there and share your badassery and don't forget, make it a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Whoop, whoop. Thank you for listening to Rain, the Real Estate Investor Growth Network. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. If you need more badassery, you can follow Jen Josie by visiting therealgenjosie.com or become a member of Rain by registering on rainmastermind.com.